I'm a scientist. I work with data. I conduct experiments. And sometimes you'll even find me wearing a lab coat just to, you know, fully conform to that stereotype. But science hasn't always been my only interest. When I was young, I fancied myself as a bit of an artist. Now, you can probably tell by the fact that I'm here talking about being a scientist that I wasn't a very good artist. But I really did like to try. And one of the things that I used to use was these kits called painting by numbers. I'm sure some of you probably have used them as well. You get a black and white page full of patterns, and each of the sections has a different number. And those numbers correspond to colored paint. And then you have to match them up. And by this process, you can learn to create shades, textures, different patterns. And you can see a lovely example of that behind me. This isn't one I did, but this is the ocean painted by numbers. Now, I'm hoping you're going to see a bit of a similarity between that picture and this one behind me now. But this is not a painting. This is a picture that's rooted very much in science. And this is satellite ocean color. You can see the ocean is not maybe the typical blue you might think it is. In fact, it's a masterpiece of colors. Even when you move away from the coastlines we're used to seeing, you can see over vast swathes of the ocean, paintbrush strokes of green, different shades of blue, even white in there as well. And this is all information. You can see here swirls. This can tell us information about how the ocean works. And these are the sorts of paintings that myself and colleagues in this field create today. Now, like me, you might be asking yourself, what is creating those colors? And I'd ask you to think a little bit about somewhere closer to where we understand, where we live. Think about the land. If you think about the green land, you think of plants. You might think of savanna grasslands. You might think of rainforests. You might think of beautiful wildflower meadows. And I'm here to tell you that the ocean has its equivalents of these great ecosystems that we see on land. And most of them are down to these guys that you can see behind me. These are phytoplankton. These are ancient relatives of the plants that we see on land today, and they live in every drop of seawater. They contain the pigment chlorophyll, just like the plants on land, and that's what makes them green. Now, a scientist you know probably a bit better than you know me um, observed that these creatures, although tiny, are absolutely exquisite and diverse. They have different shapes, different patterns, different colors. And it's these characteristics that change the ocean color. And we can get information about these creatures and about those characteristics from it. So I want to tell you three stories about using ocean color. And I'm going to start with one that is literally very close to home for me. Behind, you'll see a picture satellite picture of the southwest of the UK, and there's a city there called Plymouth. That's where I was born. It's where I work today. But I don't think Plymouth is probably the first thing you notice about this picture. Probably notice those giant white cloud-looking things, yeah? Well, they're not clouds, at least not in the traditional sense. What they are is clouds of tiny white armored warriors that have been waging a war against carbon dioxide for millennia. They're called coccolithophores, and they make little shells of calcium carbonate. This is the material, and them and relatives of theirs make up the cliffs of Dover. They're what makes them white. They were probably in the chalk that your teachers have used on blackboards when you were growing up. They're incredible little creatures, beautiful to look at. But none of this is the reason why I call them warriors. They're part of a large-scale system in the ocean called the carbon buffer. And you may have heard of ocean acidification, where carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is resulting in acidifying oceans. And these creatures and other forms of calcium carbonate in the ocean dissolve, neutralize the acid, the same way that a tablet you might take to soothe stomach acid does. And this has been happening for millennia. We can see it over the fossil record, and we can study it today to understand how our climate is changing. So we talked a little bit about the ocean being blue, a bit about it being green, a bit about it being white, but what about red? I'd probably been a bit surprised to see a red paint pot in my painting by numbers kits when I was a child, but indeed the ocean can turn red, 
and once again, it's phytoplankton that are playing the role here. These are called red tides. You may have heard them called that. They occur in coastal areas. They can occur quite naturally. They can also occur as a result of anthropogenic inputs of pollution from us on land, perhaps from excess fertilizer. In this case here, an example that's very, very close to my heart, where I first studied these blooms in Cape Town, South Africa, is where they occur naturally, when lots of nutrients are lifted into the surface waters by the winds and the currents that occur in this area. When these nutrients arrive, whether by human force or naturally, phytoplankton grow in huge volumes. And this looks amazing. But this is a time when they're not quite so benevolent. They can contain toxins. If you've ever eaten shellfish and gotten sick, it might be one of these that was responsible. When these blooms get really big as well, they can crash when the nutrients run out. And effectively, you create a giant compost heap in the ocean. All the oxygen gets pulled out. Now, if you're a lobster living in the shore, can't move very fast, can't move very far, suddenly you've got no oxygen to breathe. And along this coastline, which is fascinating, but deeply sad, you get these lobsters that just walk out of the sea because they've got no oxygen to breathe. So this area and these sorts of phenomena are a blessing and a curse. The high productivity means you've got excellent fisheries, brilliant aquaculture industries, but you also are under threat. And so we've been using satellite data to look at how, when, and why these blooms occur. And from that, we can help people to manage these impacts and support livelihoods in the sustainable use of the oceans. The last story that I want to tell you is one that's probably the most important to all of us here. I'd like to invite you to take a deep breath with me. You can thank phytoplankton for that. They produce around half of the oxygen that is in the air that we breathe, just like plants on land. And you can see it beautifully in these images behind me. You can see the seasonal breaths of the earth, of the oceans in particular. And you can see spring blooms, just like we see on land. You can see those coastal blooms that we talked about. You can even see the deserts, those purple patches in the middle of the oceans where there's a lot less life. In this video, there's 18 years' worth of ocean color data. And that's amazing. And we've now got two new satellites One's been launched, Sentinel-3A, and soon we'll have its sister instrument, Sentinel-3B. These instruments are passing overhead, giving this information to us every single day, so that now, in the future, we can paint our ocean by numbers, understand how it works, and use it sustainably for our future. Thank you very much.